Where is the leadership? Where are the friggin' politicians that will stand up and say, we need to do this? Tonight, a plea for help, and frankly, we've seen it all too often. A father mourning the senseless death of his son, and he's speaking out, challenging the government to take action after yet another senseless tragedy at a school. Tonight, we're hearing from a psychiatrist who explains why the gunman who had a proven history of mental illness was able to legally own three semi-automatic weapons. And we'll head overseas to Ukraine, where violence between Ukrainian troops and pro-Russian forces intensifying at least 45 people dead in the latest clash. And tonight, we're speaking with a local professor who is on the ground in Ukraine, monitoring the presidential election, what he has to say about the growing crisis and the ground truth. Plus, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Joe Becker, she joins us speaking with me about her new book, Forcing the Spring, Inside the Fight for Marriage Equality. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French, and thanks so much for us for joining us this evening. Well, classes at the University of California, Santa Barbara, they are canceled today. That, of course, following the deadly rampage that stole the lives of six students, injuring scores of others. The university has declared today as a day of mourning and reflection. A memorial service is being held to remember the lives that were lost. Authorities say the 22-year-old shooter opened fire across campus Friday night. He killed his roommate and two others, then moved on to a sorority house where he shot and killed two women there. Police say he then opened fire inside a convenience store on campus, taking the lives of 20-year-old Christopher Martinez and then taking his own. Martinez's father furiously calling on lawmakers for help. Where is the leadership? Where are the friggin' politicians that will stand up and say, we need to do this. We're gonna do something. Those gutless bastards have done nothing. And my son died because of it. It's outrageous, absolutely outrageous. My kid died because nobody responded to what occurred at Sandy Hook. Those parents lost little kids. It's bad enough that I lost my 20-year-old, but I had 20 years with my son. That's all I ever have. But those people lost their children at six and seven years old. How do you think they feel? And who's talking to them now? Who's doing anything for them now? Authorities say the UCSB shooter had three semi-automatic handguns that were all registered and licensed in his name. He also had a 137-page manifesto detailing his murder plot, which he called his quote-unquote day of retribution. It also pointed to his hatred of women. Police say the gunman emailed that manifesto to family and mental health professionals just minutes before he set off on his deadly rampage. Now this case, as it does to all of us, has an eerie familiarity to it. In Newtown, Connecticut, of course, a gunman with a history of mental illness also owned guns, had a manifesto, shot and killed 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary before taking his own life. President Obama, he called for tougher gun control laws and background checks for gun owners, but both proposed measures failed in the Senate despite public support. You go back to 2007, and in the spring of that year, a lone gunman opened fire at Virginia Tech, killing 32 people. Authorities say the gunman suffered from a severe anxiety disorder. And then... There was the massacre at Columbine High School back in 1999. Authorities say the rampage laid the groundwork for the others that followed. Two gunmen opening fire in a school, killing 13 people, then themselves. Both of the shooters had a history of mental illness, including personality disorders and depression. So rather than focusing on the gun control debate, which we have focused so often, there is another commonality with these tragedies, in addition to the senseless loss of life, and that is... These people with these guns were ill, mentally ill. And I want to bring in our guest. We are joined by Dr. James P. Kelleher, who is an associate professor of clinical psychiatry and behavioral science at New York Medical College. And Dr. Kelleher is also president of the Westchester District Branch of the American Psychiatric Association. Doctor, thank you so much thank you. for joining us here. Um, it's, it's early in this process, but one of the saddest elements all, of all of this was I don't know in California if anyone did anything wrong um, in that the father called out for help when he obviously saw his uh, son spiraling um, into trouble. Uh, law enforcement came, but per at least 
the standards they had to measure, um, they couldn't involuntarily commit this young man. Again, he purchased his guns legally. California is stricter than other states in terms of gun purchases. But yet somehow the pattern that we've seen in Virginia and Connecticut and Colorado and so many other places happens again here, where troubled person with access to weapons of, uh, in this case, mass destruction, um, leaves a permanent scar on too many families and leaves questions for educators and so many more as to what happens next. Um, from the outside, could more, should more have been done? Was this preventable? It's impossible for me to say. And I think the thing is with these cases, we can follow the media. Um, I, I can speak to the clinical issues that are around the assessment of violence in general. And in addition to that, I think the uh, issues around mental health care. And the, the, it's a terrible tragedy, this one. And, and of course, there have been so many, too many. Every one is, is too many. Uh, but uh, for all of that, uh, there's a tremendous amount of success behind the scenes that doesn't grab the press's attention. Uh, and I think as well as that, it, it's always very important to remember that out of the folks with mental illness, uh, they're much more likely to be the victims of violence than they are to be the perpetrators of violence. T to that end, Doctor, uh, the more we learn about uh, the shooter in this case, um, there was a history at least of some level of misogyny, um, but never carried out. Um, uh, there was uh, rantings that he may have made, but never translated into physical action or violence against others. A parent obviously caring for his child seeks out help to the authorities, but it doesn't reach that standard. Are standards too high to do something for a person that is clearly unwell? Um, is there a way maybe that even if it's not to commit the person, but to say, listen, you're, you're not in a good place here right now. If you don't want to commit yourself and we, don't, we can't reach that standard of being able to involuntarily commit you, we're going to temporarily, at least pending a hearing, take away your guns that are registered under your name. What more could be done even if the person didn't want to help himself? Well, I'm interested in creating a culture of good mental health, and part of that involves accessibility, decreased stigma, uh, so that uh, people understand that there are effective treatments available, and, and it, it, uh, it's really an area where people can, can find that they'll uh, emerge uh, healthier and happier and more, live more productive lives. Um, these incidents do uh, make things seem a little different uh, in terms of that whole scenario, and it's all about preventing things and keeping things away from people, and uh, those arguments have, uh, have their rights, and, and we really need to examine those questions. But in terms of taking a look at these, these uh, issues for individuals, um, if we had a, a, a more of a culture, perhaps, of accessibility to mental health and also to um, uh, uh, allowing uh, for a, a sensibility to, a, as, a, as a society, we need to uh, um, help folks early on in their lives with uh, problems right. that they have, um, we could probably make quite a bit of progress. If I could, th there is a common thread where you have young adults. Mm -hmm past the age where a parent can decide what they believe is best for the child mm -hmm. and mandate care. Help the public out that doesn't, uh, I speak for myself, is it much harder than we think if a person's over 18 and they don't want to get help? Mm -hmm. Even if you love that person and you know that they're, not, they're, they're definitely without care, proper care, it's going to end badly. Forget about taking, uh, taking lives, other lives other than their own. Is it really hard to get that person help if they don't want to get it? Well, I think what we've got is the intersection of uh, mental health care and uh, health care and also uh, human rights issues. And, and that's a, a sticky debate that, that, that gets played out through the issues of gun control and gets con played out even in terms of um, whether a person is, should be accessing mental health care that they don't want. Uh, there have been a number of legal issues around this, uh, and states and jurisdictions have passed certain laws, for example, I uh, in the nation. Uh, the Tarasoff ruling uh, has set a standard that if a psychiatrist or a mental health clinician uh, is aware of a credible threat to a specific other person, they have a duty to warn. That has been uh, a precedent that's been laid down for many years but now. But even that is a little bit of a gray area. What constitutes a credible threat? 
unless it's particularly articulated this person they're going to cause harm to and they believe it to be serious if it's more of an opaque threat mm -hmm. is it get hard there as well well I, I certainly think it does um, although I, I would also really try to reinforce the notion that uh, within the mental health system uh, there are probably I would suspect there are many many more cases in which um, the treatment and the outcome is very favorable all around than I even in these situations than the tragedies that hit the media but of course this is a, a, a worthy uh, large story so there's the Tarasov um, uh, precedent uh, there was also the New York State safe law which tried to build on that and it also uh, had to do with uh, issues around who would have access to weapons and guns um, so we've had a number of legal uh, precedents set and, and, and uh, it's been designed to try to help uh, actually help the clinicians I think also uh, be within the rights to mm. uh, take uh, uh, liberties of, of talking to people outside of the clinical situation. Please stay with me doctor we're going to bring in our panel after this and we're going to bring you at home into our conversation, conversation as well just head over to Facebook and Twitter and sound off on our question today. Um, with the commonalities mental ill, uh, mentally ill shooting, um, is access to guns too easy for these folks or did they just follow the right protocols and these tragedies um, even when you have the right rules in place are sometimes just unavoidable. Coming up next, our panel joins us and we'll talk about this tragedy that happened at UC Santa Barbara and where we go from here.